This is a Hot Pie Original. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Inhumane Podcast, a Hot Pie Media Original. And we are here on episode seven. So I'm so excited about this episode because um, I get asked all the time, like, how can I partake in you know, in, in eradicating human trafficking, um, whether it's on the prevention side or helping with victims, um, and survivors, so on and so forth. Right. And I'll tell you, I did a couple of, um, speaking events in March, one, just like two weeks ago, like late, late, late March, um, before a really big concert. And, uh, there was like over a thousand people at that one. And I had the privilege of staying after, and answering questions and um, people, like I said, wanting to help. And I'm like, really? It starts with you. And that's why these next two episodes is named um, like stakeholders. It starts with you because it really does. You are the first person, right? Like (laughs) just, it, it begins with you. We can't pass it off, especially once we learn about human trafficking or that we know that it exists and it exists in our area, in our backyard, right? Um, This episode is for you. Um, We're going to be talking with Karen Wiseman. She is the executive director of the Five Stone Foundation out of Fort Worth, Texas. And she's been doing this for like eight years, right? And she's just like living her best life. She knew nothing about human trafficking at all whatsoever. She's just part of this small group. And um, really, she like had a task to do. And someone suggested, hey, why don't why don't we do sex trafficking? She's like, what's that? Right. <laughs> Which I think most of us, to be fair, are internalizing and asking the same question, like, what is that? Or we've heard of it, but we have no idea even how to articulate it, um, because it really is, to be fair, a super complex issue. Um, so Karen's going to be with us. She is really, you could duplicate this. And this is why I wanted her to come on this show. Her and I have spoken quite a few times and her story is just great. Cause I, I, I was telling her, I'm like, Karen, people can totally duplicate what you and your group have done hands down and make a huge impact, not only in their community, but really in this world. And I believe that that is all of our purpose is to make an impact in another human's life. And she was able to do that. So, so excited to have Karen Wiseman uh, on today. So let's chat with her. Miss Karen, it is so good to have you on the show. Uh, We're so excited to see your face again. Like I just mentioned, I'm glad that you are safe and happy and rocking and rolling with everything that you're doing. So just a little bit, um, I mentioned in the intro of your your finance background. Um, And so with this episode, right, it's it's titled stakeholders and that it starts with you, right? Because we know so many people, they're so interested in fighting the fight of human trafficking, but they're just like, where do I start and where do I go? And this, and also it seems so overwhelming. Uh, I don't, I don't think I can help, but you were not, are not a social worker and you were in the finance space, right? Um, And it all started with a small little group. Yes. So I grew up in Fort Worth. I had no idea that any of this was going on in my city. Lived here my whole life. And um, like you say, came through the corporate world, uh, worked in finance. But I um, was attending a downtown Fort Worth where I worked. And they had a Bible study that I was a part of. And for the last couple of years, they had put me in charge of social projects. And so I had kind of exhausted the normal um, types of social projects that a Bible study group would do. And our leader, Kathy, said, well, why don't you look into sex trafficking? And 
I didn't even know what sex trafficking was. Mm -hmm. But I did have a friend that worked for the Fort Worth Police Department. And I called her and said, do we have sex trafficking in Fort Worth? Because, I mean, I knew about the prostitutes that were down on East Lancaster. You know, I kind of knew about that. But in my mind, I thought, well, you know, that's what they choose to do. Um, So my police officer friend hooked me up with Felicia Grantham, who also works for the Fort Worth Police Department. And we had a lunch that literally changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We're so excited to have uh, Felicia on the show coming up soon. Um, We got delayed with our snowmageddon that happened here in Texas. So uh, she'll be coming on in a couple of, in a couple of weeks. Um, But so I love how, you know, I think every time we talk to somebody, for sure, they all say, absolutely, on my side of town or in my town, I definitely know where there's some prostitution happening, right? Because usually it's near, um, you know, in a downtown area when you're going to go have a nice dinner or go to a sporting event, you know, there's sometimes in, in, a lot, in those kinds of areas. So you see it and it's like, hey, you know, those individuals, they just chose that, you know, they chose that life. And we know that is the oldest profession, right? That everyone speaks about. So, so that's in your mind, right? Just like, honestly, everyone we talk to and you go to this meeting and it changed your life. What are some of the most profound things during that meeting? And this, this may be a little trigger uh, for some people, um, so if you're listening to or you have children nearby or anything like that, you you just a little trigger warning. But uh, yeah, what are some profound things that happened in that meeting? Yes. So Felicia started telling me that children were being trafficked in our city. And I could not wrap my head around children. Mm. And she told me a story about, um, we. so we have gangs in our city. We're a fairly large metropolitan area. We do have gangs. And she told me a story about a girl, young girl, who was trying to escape sex trafficking, and it was the gangs that were trafficking her. Mm-hmm. Um, and the police were working with her, trying to get this young girl to leave the gangs, leave the trafficking. They said, we can get you resources. We want to help you. And the girl was scared to death. And she kept saying, I can't leave. They're going to harm my family. And the police finally convinced her, no, your family's down in Mexico. They're going to be fine. Um just come with us and, you know, we'll help you. And so she made the decision to leave the trafficking Mm -hmm. and, you know, try to get resources to change her life. Well, a couple of weeks later, she gets a box in the mail. The little girl did, and it was the head of one of her relatives down in Mexico. I mean, these gangs are so ruthless and, It had a note in the box that said, if you don't come back, uh, we'll send you another box next week. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, she had no um, option. She felt like she had to go back in order to protect her family down in Mexico. And when I heard that, I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach. I was sick. I just thought, how can this go on? And then there were other stories about kids whose, you know, parents are drug addicted and they're um, selling their children to get cracked cocaine. Um, One little girl was being sold for like $10 a pop so her mom could get cracked cocaine. She was just having her go with um, strange men and she would just say, go with them, do whatever they say, and it'll be fine. And the poor child you know, they, they don't have options. And what ends up happening is these kids will run away from those horrible situations, but then they end up in an equally horrible situation when the um, pimps or the gang members, you know, pick them up on the street. They're looking for them. Yeah. You definitely go from 
Right. Uh, and I, I think when it comes to uh, that whole family and that generation that that does that, because um, we do have that. Right. We have uh, one set of parents sold their so their kids, those kids grow up to be adults and have parents and then they sell their children. Um, we have some generational things happening there. And as you say, you know, when when these children say, OK, I'm going to leave this, I'm going to escape. But then they go right into the hands of other predators. Right. Because what are their options? They almost yeah. have none, as well as the normalization, even though that's a horrible thing that they don't want to be in and they know that it's wrong there is still some normalization in there, right? On what me is not totally wrong. For example, uh, you know, you hear all day long, some women, they're like, well, I was already being sold as a, you know, and 12 years old or 13 years old. And so I run, I run away. I run across this uh, other individual who's going to feed me, clothe me. And he's stating, putting into my head, hey, you already sold your body. Nobody wants you now, but now you can make money and now you can be in control of your own yeah. life, right? And your own destiny instead of uh, someone pimping you out. Now you can be in control of that, which we know is can't be further from the truth, right? At all whatsoever. Like just to total false promises, right? There's that fraud and coercion at its best. Um, yeah. So, so I mm -hmm. walked away from that luncheon and I decided right then and there, I cannot turn my back on these children. Now that I know this truth yeah. about what's happening in my city, mm -hmm. I, I can't turn my back. I'm, I'm in. Right. So. You, you made that decision like I'm all in. And I think that, and I thank you for that, right? I thank you for making that decision because I tell people all the time, right? It's like, what you don't know is what you don't know. But once your eyes are open, how as part of the your community and just humanity, how can we now just turn a blind eye? Like, how can we? You, I don't know how you can, right? Um, so I'm very interested to know when Felicia is giving you those statistics about what's uh, like human trafficking that's happening in your area. Like you said, you grew up in this this city, this your whole life, you raised your children in there, you're living your best life, right? Like uh, you, you're in the corporate space, you go to Bible study, your kids are doing great, all that good stuff. Um, but is it, were you getting stats that it was even happening closer to you and not necessarily on the bad side of town? No, not a, no. Um, growing up here, I never knew it was anywhere but you know over on the the one area mm -hmm. I just thought that was that was everything but yeah. yes come to find out it's everywhere it's in my neighborhood yeah. it's you know in the strip mall mm -hmm. it's very prevalent so. yeah and I and that I think is hard the hardest for people to swallow right it is. um it is. When you when we talk to a lot of right advocates um, in the anti human trafficking space, they have conversation all the time. Is that when they try to go to the suburbs or maybe a more uh, prominent uh, area of living, um, and they try to speak to those individuals, they say no, they're just so much in their bubble that they can't fathom that this could happen anywhere near them. And again, yeah. couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, Antoinette, I still run into people every day that are where I was, yeah. you know, eight years ago that right. when I tell them, hey, the, here's what's going on in Fort Worth, but they, they can't believe it. They can't mm -hmm. wrap their head around it. Yeah, so. totally. Now, um, how many women were in that in that group, in your Bible study group at, the, at uh, that time? Yeah, there's probably... Um, I mean, we had like maybe 50 women. Mm -hmm. They didn't all come to every Bible study. You know, we'd have maybe sure. 20, 20 women that would come. Okay. Like 20 active, right? You would probably say. So yeah. to me, that's an army. And yes. right. And so that is one of the things whenever, right, I've been speaking about this for 12 years and fighting it. And I, I've been telling people, it's like, we just need to raise an army. And this army 
can look like two people. It could look like 10 people. It could look like 20 people like your group. It's just, we have to do this together. Cause yes, if you try to do it solo, you're going to be burnt out. You're going to feel like you're not getting anywhere. And so your circle of influence, your, your group, you can do massive, massive things. And so one of the massive things that I know y'all have done, you started to partake in this uh, task force specifically in the Fort Worth area. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So at that luncheon, um, Felicia, you know, I told her, I said, I'm, I'm all in. And so Felicia said, I think it's time to start up, try to get this task force going. And she had the, the vision. She had really put a lot of thought into this um, about bringing together law enforcement. She works for Fort Worth PD, law enforcement and all of the non-governmental agencies in our area that deal with some aspect of trafficking. And so um, I knew absolutely nothing, but I thought, you know, I just had a heart for it. I, mm-hmm. I, I felt the calling. And so I told her, you know, I'm with you. I'm, let's yeah. do this. And so she sent out the emails. Um, we had our first meeting, brought everybody together in a room. And the first meeting had pretty good attendance. Um, But then it was like the second and third and fourth. It kind of was starting to dwindle a little bit. And it took us a while to to get it off the ground. And so we had to, there were several steps that we had to go through. Number one was um, getting the right people, building those relationships, that was really critical, especially in the beginning. And for me, it was just a huge learning process because there was so much about trafficking and, and the trauma that was created and those trauma bonds. And yeah, uh, there was just a lot to learn that first, that first year. Yeah. And see, that's, that's another, um, you know, thing when, when you and I've chatted before is I totally appreciate how much time y'all took to learn about human trafficking. Right. I think a lot of times, and I've, I've said this in a couple of, uh, uh, speaking events that I've done recently. And I said, look, I know that when you hear this, right, there's, especially when I'm like speaking bold and saying, we need to raise an army and I implore you to do this and so on and so forth. So I'm like getting people pumped up and they're appalled, right, as they should be that this stuff is happening in their community. And so when I'm speaking to them like that, they're like, okay, I'm all in, I'm ready, let's go. And I said, I'm so excited, but I do need you to learn about yeah. some of these things. And yeah. and the reason being, right, is it's going to prevent burnout. It's going to so that you obviously can comprehend. Um, and so when you're speaking about it, because people rebuttal all day long, right? Especially like stating, well, no, they're prostitutes and they're exotic dancers. They choose to be there. Like I can't comprehend that that's human trafficking and so on and so forth. So that's a big piece and understanding the trauma because going back to the convert or the story that Felicia told you about the young girl, she had family in Mexico and she couldn't leave. Right. Um, one of the things that pointed you, you, that stuck out to me is she was so trusting of the law enforcement who was willing to help her and all the resources that they were providing. We know that doesn't happen all the time because it's taken a while for a lot of law enforcement and and not all law enforcement is trained right in, in trauma um, and understanding human trafficking where we're seeing them as a victim opposed to uh, you know, breaking the law. Right. So, So we need to know these things because as soon as you chat with a survivor or victim at the time, they are sizing you up like that. They are, they, they, there is no trust. We have to work on building that trust, right? Because there have been broken promises. There have been, um, and not just promises. I mean, people are invading and exploiting them all day long. So it is a big deal that we understand that when we're talking to them, right? They've never had a normal relationship. 
everyone wants something from them. Yes. So then when you're nice to them, in their mind, they're thinking, what do you want? Yeah. What is she going to make me do? Or what is she trying to get from me? Mm -hmm. So true. That's so true. So, so I appreciate really the time that you, you, that task force has taken to learn that first year because it is so vital. Are we still learning? Yes. We're totally still learning, right? Every, like there are changes constantly. So we never stop learning about it, but I think it will save you a lot of heartache yourself, as well as if you're in it to prevent um, and to protect, right? Um, I think we we do. We have to be as knowledgeable as possible. And this can't just be like a like a hobby. <laughs> you know, yeah. it just, it can't. You're dealing with people's lives. And the other thing that first year really allowed us to do was formulate, like, what is our vision Mm. with this task force? What do we hope to accomplish? And one of the things we really had to look at is what resources do we have to bring to bear on this issue? And what are the gaps that we're missing? And yeah, I love that. And I so just to remind our listeners, so you had law enforcement and you had a lot of, did you have private sector at all? Uh, we, at that point, we just had some of the agencies okay. that like nonprofits, that mm -hmm. some of them would help victims, um, some of them would provide counseling or um, housing, but we didn't have the church yet. Okay. And there came a point mm -hmm. when we were meeting that I personally realized, you know what? We need the church. This is such a spiritual battle. Mm. The enemy here is so, um, it's just evil and demonic. The things, you know, you hear the stories when you visit with these survivors, what they've been through. Yeah. And at that point, I, I went to my church and said, we don't need money. <laughs> <laughs> we need you to come and provide. We need prayer. We need leadership. Um, we need to take this to the next level. Yeah. And I just felt like that was how we could do it. And that made a huge difference. Things, it seemed in my mind, things really started to happen then quickly. Is it and because more, you had more manpower? Uh, like we, definitely prayer. I totally get that. But was it more of the manpower or... Um, what specifically do you think yeah, really helped? Yeah. So the church shows up and says, what do you, you know, okay, what have we got? What are, you know, what do we need to do? And one of the first things the police said, well, we need this software, but we can't get it approved because it's not in the budget. Yeah. Um, but we need the software. They said, if you can prove, you know, that it works, then we'll put it in the budget, but they couldn't prove it worked unless they had it. So, um, the church Christ Chapel stepped up and said, we'll buy the software. And so they purchased it and started having some success and, you know, tracking traffickers and, and helping victims, you know, finding them and rescuing them. Um, and then, yes, the church also brings volunteers and resources um, yeah. to help out in the different areas. Okay. Now that, I think is a perfect example, right, of how, because too many times, especially as a community, we, I think, put all of our faith and all of the responsibility on just law enforcement and the government. And they're going to fail every time because one, lack of capacity, lack of funding, lack of resources, um, and then all the red tape. So- yeah. You have all of these things all day long that are just huge obstacles. But what you y'all have done, right, is said, oh, okay, well, let's go to the community, which your community was like, let me go to Christ Chapel. Let me go to them. We have a whole bunch of people that are supposed to be all about helping the community, right? That doesn't ne maybe necessarily look like them or have the same background as them, right? It's supposed to be all so let's utilize them to partner up with 
a government entity or a city entity, which is our municipality of law enforcement, help them because they're all alone <laughs> and they lack resources as well. And so that is what I think the biggest thing that the community to do, c- community can do. And like you said, it's not just about uh here you go, here's here's money all the time. But it's like, well, what can we do? What is lacking? What is where is maybe the biggest priority that we could focus on? And you did. And boom, there you go. And that's what I'm saying is like the stakeholder kind of starts with you. Like, where is your circle of influence? Where is your group that you always hang out with or something along those lines? And there's trust and the community lines up with your local government or police force or whoever. Yes. It's all and you then, need to do. <laughs> yes. And and it's like what what we started to see over time is okay, there are members of our community that are standing with these agencies mm-hmm. month after month, you know, showing up at the meetings. And that's a big part of it. Showing up, making those connections, those relationships, because um, as time went on. I mean, I was at every meeting. I was there. And so they got to know my face and they're like, okay, she's not going away. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Maybe we can trust her. Mm -hmm. And the individual organizations, they got to know each other. The executive directors got to know each other and they started trusting each other. Mm -hmm. And so then what you have is instead of all these organizations kind of going their different ways, Um, Now they're forming this cohesive unit and working together to move in one direction. And they started finding out, okay, we do this. What do you do? Right. And if you've got two people doing the same thing, then the other groups might say, well, nobody's doing this thing. Let us take that and we'll go in that. And so then we begin to start to fill in the holes Mm -hmm. and, and then use the community. So like um, I became friends with our Homeland Security officer and she she started out small. She said, we need some notes for survivors. So I said, you got it. And I delivered her a big envelope that um, our um, Bible study group put together for, yeah. for the survivors. So then... She comes, so next time it's like, okay, we just rescued this little girl. She doesn't have any clothes. Can you help? Yes. My small group put together, you know, we gathered clothes, everything this little girl needed. Because when they're rescued out of trafficking, they literally have the clothes on their back Mm -hmm. and they're usually not appropriate. So they need everything. Sure. And so that's where... a you know, just a group of citizens can step in and provide that. And then we started providing Christmas um, for survivors. We would get a group of um, kids and sometimes it was the first time they'd ever had a real Christmas. You know, we would gather gifts for them. So it just, it kind of starts small and you have to build that trust and then they will give you larger and larger projects to work for. Right. Right. No, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think, um, like you said, you, you want to start off small, just Mm -hmm. plain and simple, like, like what we're talking about, right. You really want to start off small so we can all understand the capacity and the trust and things of that nature. And then it, and then it morphs into whatever the need is. Right. Um, and I want to circle back to real quick, um, See, that's that's another reason, right? We really wanted you on the show is what you're doing up there, the Five Stone uh, Task Force, is you guys have worked really hard in the past eight years, right? Ish, nine, seven-ish or something like that um, to knock down those silos. And you and I have had this conversation before, um, right? Like I've talked to people all over the United States and internationally, and we work in silos. And I come from nonprofit as well. And we don't like to play well together in the same sandbox. We want to keep building our own sandbox and not realizing like, hey, within just this like uh, 10 by 10, we've built like 10 sandboxes when we can just build one. (laughs) 
You know what I mean? And everybody is functioning in a cohesive way, like you mentioned, and we're filling those gaps. And when we're working in these silos, unfortunately, those gaps grow and they get larger and larger and larger. Um, And to me, if one person falls through the crack, that is one too many. Right. Um, no matter what government entity it is and even the nonprofits. Right. Uh, same same thing. We're, we're mm-hmm. there for a reason. And we know I think in the nonprofit space, we kind of get into that that mentality of like we can't help them all. This is just what our nonprofit can do, which I totally get that. But if we are literally joining forces and no longer competing we are going to actually win. Now that's an army, right? Because most of the times it's separate armies. And, you know, in a very non-malicious way, we're kind of fighting against each other and don't realize that when I'm like, man, when it comes to nonprofit, there is no competition. Like, I think we believe like we're fighting for the same donors and we're, and we're not. (laughs) And we're never going to run out of victims, right? We're never going to, like, there is no reason to continue working in silos. Um, It's better for your community and then the state as a whole if we are talking and really talking and really being transparent and saying, hey, like you mentioned, um, this is a need that we need in our area, but maybe I'm too full. I can't put that on our plate. And Mm -hmm. another group says, hey, I'll take it. Great. We'll send all of our people that way or resources or whatever the case may be. Um, And I think that's so key. And we lose that too many times, right? Um, And I love that in Fort Worth, the organizations really support each other. Yeah. And it's so sweet. If one um, organization will have like a fundraising event, Mm -hmm. the other organizations will buy tables and send representatives to that event to show their support. And I I just, I love that. And now we've got two organizations that are actually operating out of the same building. Um, One of them has support group meetings. And so the other groups will send their people to the support group meetings. Mm. We've got another organization that um, provides employment um, for the um, people that are 16 or older. And so all of the organizations can send people there for employment. So it's so beautiful when everyone works together like that. Mm -hmm. That makes it right. Limitless as well as when I continue to say that we, you know, I know my personal mission as well as the mission of the Inhumane podcast and other things that we do when we coach survivors, it's very much of we are here to eradicate human trafficking. And we know that we can if obviously we stop the demand, but then if we also stop working in silos and the community is involved, like to me, it's a three prong, (laughs) you know, attack. Um, And I know we can do it. And we just have to trust each other, I think, as professionals so that like I said, competition is completely out the door. Um, and and another goal, right, is getting more of the private sector involved because they are so involved and they have major influence, right, over our purchasing power and things of that nature. Um, so that is one of the things we want to focus on, right? So I would love for everyone to come back to part two of Stakeholders. It starts with you. We are going to wrap up our conversation with Karen Wiseman, the executive director of the Five Stone Foundation. And guys, you don't want to miss part two. We are diving a little bit deeper. There are action steps that you can take here if you want to help stop human trafficking. Um, She's just going to give us all these gems. So we will see you back on part two. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home on the web at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.